All right. Welcome to this class. Um, sorry, I the institutional Zoom wouldn't log in at the time that I indicated, and uh, it has been quite tough trying to log in. All right. So I'm recording this lecture, and then uh, I'll upload it on to Sakai. So just try and download it. Okay. So the previous sections, previous uh, in the last class, we looked at demand, uh, demand for goods and services. And then we looked at um, supply. So just to recap some of the things we talked about, talked about individual demand. Let me just make sure I'm recording. Yes, individual demand, uh, market demand, and then uh, some basic concepts about um, how to represent demand. So demand being represented in a tabular form, uh, in a using a curve, and we say it's a downward sloping demand, uh, downward sloping curve, okay? And then we said you can also represent demand as an equation. So I also touched on that as the equation, okay? And then we spend time on why the law of demand holds, okay? Substitution effect, income effect, okay? And then we touched on the other determinants of demand. So the all the other determinants of demand, consumer income, expectations, price of related products. So I'm just going to quickly just to bring you guys to par with what we have discussed. Okay. And then I explained the concepts, the differences between change in demand and change in quantity demanded. And if you uh, if you follow the class, the last session, we said that a change in demand uh, results in a shift in the demand curve, either to the left or to the right and it's caused by the other determinants of demand. While the change in quantity demanded uh, refers to movement along the same uh, demand curve, and this is caused by a change in the goods on price, right? So these are uh, very important concepts that we've gone through already. And then I showed you this graph. Then we spend a bit of time on the functional form uh, of the demand equation. And we said that, I said that, for demand, the relationship between price and quantity demanded is negative, okay? And wherever you see that the relationship between price and quantity demanded is positive, it's more likely to be supply. And quantity, and quantity the, the relationship between price and quantity is positive, then it's more likely to be a supply curve, okay? So we've gone through these things. You can read the, or watch the video from the previous session uh, to just get the, that understanding, okay? So I'm just going through quickly uh, through this, going through some of the things we have already discussed. And then we spend some time on supply and uh, a lot of the concepts that are introduced under demand uh, were, uh, also si were similar when we discussed the market supply, individual supply and market supply, okay? And in the same vein, we said that apart from price, other factors drive supply. But what you should keep in mind is a positive relationship between price and quantity supplied, okay? So other factors, technology, input cost, these are factors that will, can shift the supply curve, okay? So this is the supply uh, increase or decrease in supply can be impacted by technology, input cost, price of related products, government policies, these can are factors that can shift the supply curve to the right or to the left, okay? And for that reason, we also explain, I also explain the concept, uh, uh, concept related to change in supply and change in quantity supply, similar to what we did under the demand function, okay? So we are seeing that a change in supply refers to a shift of the supply curve to the left or to the right. And it's caused by the other determinants of supply, okay, apart from the goods on price. Whilst a change in quantity supply is uh, as a result of a change in the goods on price, okay. So please go through this review and then try to get uh, good uh, basics for the last sessions of this class, okay. And then I completed the market equilibrium where I explained it. I combined the, uh, what do you call it, the demand curve and the supply curve, both using the graphics and also using uh, equating 
demand equals to uh, supply. And we said it occurs when at the going price. Yes, I explained all that. Okay. And then we went into the uh, demand and supply analysis, quantity, de quantity demanded equals to quantity supplied. And therefore we are able to compute the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity, which we did on the whiteboard in the other class. Okay, so for today's class, I will go into the effect of changes in demand and supply. So what happens when there are changes in demand and supply? We analyzed a bit of that in the previous session, but I will take time to also go through that for this session. So a change in demand, and remember that we said a change in demand is triggered by changes, factors other than the goods on price, okay? so. When any of the determinants of demand except the goods own price changes, it causes a change in demand. And we said this change can be a leftward shift or a rightward shift, okay, in the demand function. Such changes in demand will affect the equilibrium price. And last week, I sh showed you how the equilibrium price will change if there's an increase in supply or there's an, uh, an decrease in demand or any form of combination, okay. So such demand, such changes in demand will affect equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. A change in income, uh, price of related commodity, size of the market, taste and preferences will all shift the demand curve and affect equilibrium price and quantity. Okay. So assuming that the average income of Ghanaians increases and that I explained it the other time. Okay. Assuming that it, it increases, what will be the effect of that price increase, okay? What would be the effect of that, uh, that income increase on equilibrium, okay? How would that affect the market equilibrium for a product, okay? And we said that such changes in demand will affect the equilibrium price and quantity, um, so yeah, so this is a, a typical example. An increase in demand for a product, uh, say we are D1, the original demand and original supply curve. If there's an increase in demand, just think uh, practically, more people are demanding the good. What will, rise? what will happen? Price of the good will rise, okay? So you have a shift from D1 to D2. And, because, and it's a shift because it's other factors of demand that is changing apart from the goods own price, okay? So th these other factors. So there's a demand increase, maybe caused by, uh, in this example, caused by higher income. Then people have more money, they're willing to buy more goods and services, and for that reason, prices will rise, okay? And that is what you see here. The original equilibrium price was six Ghana cities. With an increase in demand, the new, the new equilibrium is established at this point. Uh, with a resulting quant price of seven cities. So an increase in income triggers an increase in price. Okay. So that's why sometimes people, when people are, if uh, in an economy, people are fighting to get increase in salary or doubling of the sal salary, does not mean that their welfare will, will improve or increase, right? Because the more money they have, the higher the prices that will exist in the market, and their purchasing power may, may not change, okay? So these are some of the underlying economic principles, okay? So this is a change in demand. You can have a change in supply, which means it's a supply curve that is rather changing, okay? And that this analysis, go to the last video. We did the, the end of the last session. Uh, I did some examples of the changes, okay? Spend some time on that. As we demand a change in any of the determinants of supply, except the goods own price will also shift the supply curve. So technology can shift the supply curve. Recall that the supply shift factors include technology, price of input, government taxes, and subsidies, okay? 
So if input prices increase in the market, it means that the firms will reduce the supply. The supply will reduce. And a reduction in supply will mean that the supply curve that we see here, the supply curve will shift to the left. Okay. It means supply has reduced. If it shifts to the right, it means supply has increased. Okay. So if input cost increases, then supply curve will shift to the left. And if input cost decreases, then firms can supply more. Supply will shift to the right, okay? So suppose that the price of rye plantain uh, increases uh, by 20% due to poor harvest. So if it's poor harvest, then it means that supply has reduced because output has fallen because of poor harvest. And that had triggered a 20% increase in the price okay so you can analyze this uh how the increase in price uh driven by poor harvest okay in increase in price of ripe plantain caused by poor harvest will impact uh the equilibrium in the Kilewile market okay so you can already see this is the first an increase in the in price okay this is supply has reduced which led to an increase in prices. So you can already see there are two ways through which supply can increase or prices can increase in the economy. One, if demand increases, prices will increase. And if supply reduces, so prices will also increase. Okay. So you can already think that if you have a case where uh, demand is increasing, which is triggering higher prices, and on top of it, firms are reducing output. That will lead to a much higher price uh, of the product, okay. for the product. OK. So in the clinical example, we can identify the effect of a bumper harvest of granules on the equilibrium of clinical. Okay. So if you, you assume that clinical and granules are complements, then what happens if there is bumper harvest uh, for granules, what will happen to the market equilibrium for kilowatt and granules? Okay, so if you assume that they are complementing, they are consumed together, and for that reason, how does this development affect the market equilibrium for granules and kilowatt? So if you take the granules market, right, you have the demand for granules and you have the supply of granules, and this is giving a certain equilibrium price. Okay. The scenario says that there is a um, bumper harvest, okay? So supply has increased significantly for granules. So supply shifts down. And if you have, it's like bumper harvest for tomatoes, there's too much tomatoes in the market, prices will fall, right? So you have a reduction in price to P2. Cool. If there's a reduction in price for P2, then the price of granite becomes cheaper. And if you are going to buy kilowatt, you can afford to buy more of kilowatt and even more of granite. Okay, so demand for kilowatt will actually increase. Okay. So products are complements, they go hand in hand. When the price of one drops, uh, the demand for the product, both products will increase because the prices are lower. Okay. So that is how you analyze the, the set products that you are selling that are complements or products that you are, services that you are selling that are complementary, okay? If there is a, a demand shock, or in this case, there is a supply shock, okay? Positive supply shock. There is more output produced, okay? Which triggers lower price. And that lower price improves your purchasing power. And for that reason, you can buy more of the other good also. All right, so you can apply all these things to um, the prices, how the, the upward and downward movement of the price level of products. Okay, so demand and supply analysis impact all your prices. Okay, so if we are demanding a lot, or we are driving more, we'll be de demanding more fuel. Okay, prices are going to rise. And periods where factories are shut down and they, are, they, are, they don't need a lot of fuel, prices will come down. Okay. So these are some of the uh, time series that shows the fluctuations in crude oil price. And this is driven um, some by 
low demand from China and all that. Okay, you can see the data even for the recession period, for the coronavirus period, you see people were not driving, going to work. So prices of fuel just came down. Okay, and now it's picked up again because we're back to pre COVID uh, 19 activities. Okay. All right, if you have any question uh, as you go through the video, uh, please uh, write them down. I will take all the questions in my live session next week. Okay, my live session next week. So if you have any question on this part, please note them down and I will deal with them in the live session. Okay. So you can apply the demand and supply to so many things, so many products. Okay. Uh, in 2014, for example, crude oil price was around 115 uh, USD per barrel. Okay. Oil price since June 2014, the price of oil collapsed. So the price of oil came down. And if for a price of oil to come down, there are supply side factors and demand side factors that will cause that to happen. Okay. So you can already analyze uh, what demand side factors and supply side factors can lead to a lower price. Okay. If demand falls, okay. if you go back to the curve, uh, to any of the curves, okay, here, if demand falls, that means demand shift to the left, okay, the D1 shift to the left, prices will fall. And in practice, that's what. People are not buying, prices will fall, okay? And if firms supply too much, too, prices will fall, okay? So how does this development affect the market equilibrium for, oh, no, 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 this one. It's reached 28 barrel in January 2016, so it fell drastically, okay? And this, as I said, is also triggered by the demand and supply factors. It has now recovered to 41 cents. Why have crude prices fallen? Uh, as I said, there they, they are demand side factors that can cause that and there are supply side factors, okay? So the demand side factors, the demand, consumer demand wasn't so high. So falling global growth, okay? Especially in China and other emerging economies. So, so demand shocks, okay? People, people were not demanding much, much. Income levels came down uh, and for that reason, uh, demand for fuel also came down, okay. So reduced demand for oil for various manufacturing processes, especially in China. China they have a lot of companies, firms using fuel. And, and for, so if demand falls, it affects the entire economy, the entire, entire world market price, okay, the world market price. Supply side factors can also, as I explained, can also cause a drop in price if uh, rising production from the from US. So US, if US ends up increasing supply, okay, from the Asheo revolution, okay, then output will rise, okay. And, um, and so these are some of the things that uh, uh, impact the price. Okay. And if the cartels decide to reduce price, uh, refuse of OPEC to reduce prices, if the cartels decide that, okay, we want to reduce price or we want to increase price, that can also influence the price. They may not have to peg, they, they will probably will not peg the price, that a low price or high price. They just have to, if they want to reduce the price, they'll flood the market with more oil and the price of four. And if they want to increase price, they will reduce their output weekly production. If they reduce the weekly production, the uh, demand relative to the demand for oil in the world, prices will rise. So they, would not, they don't have to explicitly say that uh, I'm fixing the price, but the group can just decide that for the month of February, we are producing 50 barrels of fuel. And if we do that, uh, people will look for fuel, they won't get, and a few people will get, they will have to be willing to pay a higher price uh, for it. Okay. All right. Both demand, uh, both fall in demand and rise in supply has created an excess supply or a glut. Okay, so if you have fall in demand, as I explained, people are not buying uh, because the lower income levels. On top of it, firm, countries are producing so much oil, then prices will fall even further. Okay. For any product, you don't want to be in a situation. You don't want to be in a situation where 
demand for your product is coming down while you are producing more. Okay? That is just not a sustainable uh, business model to follow. So, so the, that is very important to make sure you try to control that you control the demand side factors and then you control the supply side factors in, in, in this regard. Okay. All right. So this takes us to two very important concepts that we need to uh, have uh, and try to understand. And uh, these two concepts, the first one is called is price controls. So application of demand and supply. Uh, I try to introduce price controls in our last session. Here, I'll formalize the, the concept of price controls, okay? And then at the end of today's session, I will introduce the concept of elasticities, okay? All right, so let's talk about price controls. Price controls is pretty straightforward. Uh, if you understood the demand curve, you understood the supply curve, uh, that intersection be, uh, between, uh, between supply and demand translates to equilibrium price and quantity, and that is the market prices, which are influenced by market forces, the demand side forces and the supply side forces. Any other price that government will want to set uh, or any institution want to set uh, will be price control. Okay? So you can set a very higher price beyond equilibrium or you can set a lower price below, uh, a price below equilibrium, okay? So let me formalize it. I know I explained it in the previous, the end of the previous session, uh, but let me try to formalize it here. All right, uh, after the price controls uh, session, I will end the video and record and save the recording. I don't want the video to be so huge that I cannot upload to Sakai. Okay. So bear with me. So sometimes government may be unhappy with market determined prices. We want the market to influence uh, to determine prices, but sometimes government may say that all oh, the prices are not so high enough or they are too high and then government will try to enforce a price. So market determined price directly government will try to intervene in the market to fix the prices. And last week I explained that this fixing of prices is not sustainable, okay? It will collapse, okay? So keep that in mind. They may fix the price below or above the market price, okay? When a government imposes a price that is above the market price, okay? So you are setting a price that is above the market price. Then we say that we have a minimum price, okay? Let me use uh, the whiteboard to illustrate this. Let me try to draw the, the curve that I just, what I just um, indicated. Okay. So let's draw a typical demand and supply curve. Okay, so this is the, the axis. Okay, uh, for the sake of time, this, let me just quickly draw supply curve. By now you should know what, how a supply curve looks like. And let me draw a demand curve, okay. Okay. This will give us the equilibrium price and this will give us equilibrium. And this will give us equilibrium quantity. equilibrium price, equilibrium quantity. So let's call the equilibrium price PE. Okay, and let's call the equilibrium quantity QE. Something like this. Let me make the P here. That's okay. All right, so this is the equilibrium point here, right in the middle, okay? And here is the supply curve. And here is the demand curve. Okay. And then there you are, you have the equilibrium uh, price and equilibrium quantity. Let's say the equilibrium price is five, oh, and it can be any amount. 
and equilibrium quantity is 20. And government says that, okay, hold on a second. The equilibrium price that the market is deciding or determining is too low. So let me fix a price which is above. So last week at the end, I explained a bit of this. So I'm just going over that. What in effect, so government says now the price is too low, it should be 10. And as I, last week I explained, if you increase the price be, beyond the equilibrium price, you see that demand for, uh, demand for the good will fall, okay? But firms will be willing to supply more and that will create the excess supply in the market, okay? So we are saying that if the government fixes a price that is above the equilibrium price, we call that price the minimum price. It's kind of counterintuitive, but yes. If the government fixes a price that is above equilibrium price, we are saying that that price is the minimum price. Take for example, the minimum wage, okay? The minimum wage, for example, the minimum wage in principle is saying that the equilibrium wage is too low. And for that reason, uh, you cannot charge the pay anybody the equilibrium wage of five cities. So government says the minimum wage that anybody should pay a worker should be 10 cities. So it's a minimum wage, but it's set above the equilibrium wage. So nobody can go below this 10. So the 10 becomes the minimum in the market. Okay, the minimum wage in the market. Okay. So that is very important that you understand that the minimum wage is the minimum price is set above the equilibrium price. So that is, you can go over the audio if something is not uh, clear. So let me go through the text on, on the slide. Okay. okay, so the when the government imposes a price above the market equilibrium price, we have the minimum price. Okay, so it's the minimum price, uh, the price floor. A common example is the minimum wage. So it's the minimum price, you can't go below that price, okay? And when the government imposes a price which is below market price, we have a maximum price. And an example is rent control. So I can show and use the whiteboards to start demonstrate the maximum price. So government says that if it's rent, say the rent for um, the, the rent, the equilibrium rent is five cities. But government says that, or 500, government says that you can only charge 200, okay? Government says that you can only charge 200 or two cities, okay? Let's say government says you can charge two cities. It means that even though the, uh, the market says the equilibrium rent should be five cities, government is imposing a price which is below the market price at two cities, meaning that you cannot uh, charge any price below below that, okay? You cannot charge any price below the uh, uh, ceiling, okay? So this becomes the maximum price or maximum rent you can charge. You cannot go beyond, below, beyond the maximum of two to go and charge five. And that is why we are calling it the maximum price in the economy. Okay. So that is the the explanation when it comes to uh, when it comes to the um, equilibrium price in the market. Okay. So that is price control. The, the minimum price is a government imposed price that producers are allowed to charge. So that is the minimum price set above the equilibrium price, and then it's usually set to above the market price, and it's illegal to pay below the minimum, okay? So it's illegal to pay below the minimum, but buyers are allowed to pay higher than the minimum, okay? So if you set it, if you set the price higher than equilibrium, what we are saying is that, no, you can't pay below this price, but you can pay above the price, okay? You can pay, you, can, you are free to pay above. 
So the minimum wage, if it's 10 Ghana cities, you can pay the minimum wage, but you can also pay 100 Ghana cities okay, above the price. Uh, the, the, the reason why we set the minimum uh, price or the minimum wage is to protect uh, workers, right? So it's usually to pay, uh, it's illegal to pay below the minimum, but buyers are allowed to pay above. They are designed to protect the suppliers in the market. So in the labor market, for example, the suppliers are the workers. Okay? So we protect the workers in the labor market. The minimum price policy always leads to excess supply and that i explained also so if you set a minimum price uh, it leads to excess supply if you say that for a laborer or a cleaner now you have to pay 100 ghana cities an hour people will do it themselves right, right but more people will be willing to supply their time so supply will be higher than demand so a minimum price policy uh like a minimum wage if it's binding uh leads to excess supply and will not be sustainable until additional measures are taken. Once you have excess, which I also explained last the last session, once you have excess, the excess here, you have excess supply. Those who don't have a job because they are cleaners and the government says they should be paid 100 Ghana, so they will undercut the prices and they will move you back to equilibrium. Okay. Maximum price, I explained, maximum price is set below the equilibrium price like the rent control prices, okay? And the maximum, it is called the maximum price because it is the maximum that suppliers are allowed to charge for the good or service. So it's the maximum price in the market, okay? So you can go, it's like the two example, the two that I showed you on the whiteboard, it's the maximum price. Uh, and a maximum price also can, leads to uh, it leads to excess demand. Well, the minimum leads to excess supply, but the maximum price leads to excess demand. Okay. If the equilibrium price, I explained last week that the equilibrium price for a two bedroom is 500. Government said that, no, you can't charge 500, you should charge only 200. Demand for two bedrooms will be higher than supply of two bedrooms. And this will create this excess demand in the market. Okay, So it's important that uh, you understand these concepts uh, as they are explained. So until the excess demand is eliminated from the market, the control price will collapse. And it's the same concept. If you fix a price, if you fix a price, like let me go back to the whiteboard. If you fix a price that is below the market price um, and people are looking for two bedrooms and they cannot get because uh, the price is lower than equilibrium, they will begin to uh, give higher offers. Okay, so the the price control at the base will not hold in the long run. Okay. All right, I'm going to end this session here and then uh, I'll break it just to save the audio and then continue uh, uh, the other sections. <laughs>